Uh, good afternoon. The date is May 25th, 2021, and the time is 4.31 p.m. To ensure we have a quorum present, I'm going to read out the names of the members of the executive committee, and if you're on the call, please say present. I'm on the call. Cullen Clark? Present. Uh, Don uh -huh. Davidson? Present. Thank you. Kathy Estrada? Present. Uh, Cam Johnson? Ardo Fuentes, Ed Tarr. Ardo is here and Lael's being admitted now. Okay. Can you, okay, sorry, I, th I thought I said present. I was on mute, apologize. Okay, uh, Andre Mc, uh, McEwing, John McPherson, James Stanton, Michael Stack, Present. John Becker. Present. And Ryan Moss. So thank you. I note here that we have a quorum of the executive committee present, and I'll call this uh, to order this meeting of the Board of Uplift Education. I'd like to congratulate one of our board members on a recent promotion. Uh, congratulations goes to Elena McFan on a recent promotion to president of Anthem's Medicare business. Uh, Elena joined our board during COVID, and so she probably hasn't had a chance to meet a lot of you, but uh, we'll certainly find more opportunities to come together in person and, uh, and be able to, to meet you. I also like uh, to ask Ann Erickson to introduce a special guest joining us today uh, who is supporting Ann in our HR equity work. And would you mind making that introduction? Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Richard. Hello, everybody. Uh, I have with me tonight uh, our new colleague, Jerry Bradley, who has been providing direct support to me and my team on the efforts that we are leading around creating a three year plan to increase uh, diversity at Uplift. So I look forward to speaking to that more tonight. Uh, and Jerry, we're really happy to have you here. Thank right. you, Anne. It's good here. Good to be here. Well, great. Um, look forward to uh, some interaction as the meeting goes on. Um, our first order of business is to consider and take action on the previous board minutes from April 27, 2021. Hold on. I'm good. Um, from April 2021, which are provided in the pre read. Are there any questions from the board? If not, do I have a motion to approve the April 27, 2021 board meeting minutes as presented? This is Lael, I so move. Thank you, Lael. Is there a second? This is Elena, I second. Thank you. Hearing none, I'll ask Alex. Wait, actually, I'm sorry. Are there any votes against the motion? Hey, actually, Richard, I'm sorry. Hey, Elena, I, really, I appreciate the vote for it, but we, we actually need a, a, a voting not member. It. Yeah, no, but thank you. Thank you for the support, though. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. thank you for being enthusiastic. OK, yeah, got it. Sure. Happy to second. Thanks, Gollum. OK, are there any votes against the motion? Hearing none, I ask Alex to know that all members of the executive committee present voted in favor of the motion and the motion passes. Thank you. Uh, we'll next hear from Deborah Bingham for an update on the board development committee. Deborah, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. And, and obviously, John Becker, not Deborah, but uh, I'll make a few comments if I may. Uh, and can we swap, move to the next slide, please? Yeah, there, there we go. Uh, before I start, let me thank the committee. We, we had a productive year, in my humble opinion. Uh, we've got myself and three others. Lena, Ricky, and Christina, uh, and, and this, we had numerous meetings, and I think the output and the, the, where we are today, we, we've laid a great, great foundation for where we need to go in the future. The slide that's up now was, we'll go back, uh, was mm -hmm. actually presented to the board in December, and, and, and I think it's you know, a fair summary of where we are at this point. A, a quick reminder that we, we are moving from 
building, raising money to build buildings to we still have some of that and 50% or so of our, our need going forward will be that. But in addition to that, annual funds that can be used and will be used in our operating budget. Uh, and, and lost in some part because the state or the federal funding won't pay for things. In some cases, we want to provide more than we can with the funding that we have. Uh, the board's role in this is going to be incredibly important. And this year was really a, a year for getting the foundation set. And, and John, just quick. one minute, please. Would all everyone mind going on mute except for John? We're picking up some background noise. I apologize, John, for interrupting you. Uh -huh. so you everyone could go on mute, yeah. please. Thank you. You'd ask me to go on mute. No, not you, John. You, oh. you are staying oh. off of mute. Everybody else, I need on mute. I'm, I'm. Are you hearing that background noise? Yeah, it sounds like somebody in a car or something. It does. Okay, I'm gonna try to figure out who it is. Uh, who my there we go. List. Oh, there we go. Thank you, friends. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the, the board is going to be very important in terms of doing this in the future. And again, Deborah here in a second is going to show a little bit about what we've done this year in terms of money raised, but also lay out what's being included in the fiscal year 2022 budget. Uh, and I'll also say that it's our expectation that we'll be providing regular updates to the board on the progress that's being made. So, and, and make one other comment. I made this the other day when I was speaking to Richard Coleman and Yasmin, and, and when I, I've now been rolled up my sleeves and been involved this in this for the last year and oftentimes when I when any of us walk into a new situation we've kind of find a mess and and I have to say that the work that Deborah and her team have done that not only the success but the the quality of the people and the the quality of the the, the foundation that they have laid is phenomenal so I'm very optimistic that uh, we're going to continue to make great strides going forward and be very successful in these new goals. So my compliments to Deborah and her team. Deborah, you're up. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. It's been fun working with our committee. They're uh, really hands on. We've been meeting monthly and um, it's been great. So we appreciate you all diving in. So this slide shows uh, our total giving for this fiscal year as of May 21st. We have, you know, a about a month more until the end of our fiscal year. Um, so you can see um, the comparison of board giving from this year to last year. So we've increased in that. So thank you very much. 73% uh, of board members have get, have made a gift um, during this fiscal year. So we appreciate that. We hope as we go into next fiscal year, ne next fiscal year, gosh, that was a tongue twister, we'll get 100% of support. Um, I know it was a little bit of a crazy year here in COVID. You can see we raised $6.6 .6 million towards those broad categories. Um, and it's been a really good year for us. You know, Uplift typically will raise anywhere from six to $12 million. Just kind of depends on where we are on the cycle and uh, what kind of growth programs we have. That's typically what we're uh, raising funds for. And you can see we have quite a few funds around um, Road to College and Career, SEL, so key programs that do need regular fundraising to help support us implementing those programs um, in our schools. Next slide, please. So we talked about this back in December. We have gone back and really thought about splitting out our um, annual needs and our capital campaign needs. And before they were really, as you saw in the previous slides, kind of lumped together. We just called it capital campaign, even though some of it was really an annual giving need that we needed. So for the next five years, we're really going to focus on supporting the strategic plan. And what we boiled it down to is that we need to raise about $1.34 million to support those programs on an annual basis. Next slide, please. And then I think we skipped a slide actually. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Deb, there's a bit of a delay on my end. Oh, no problem, Alex, I appreciate it. Um, the annual giving, as you all see, we have sources. It comes from North Texas Giving Day, our 
annual mailer. We're hoping it'll come from our annual campaign mailer that we're going to start doing, Dinner and Dialogue, Senior Decision Day. It has broadly gone to support Road to College and Career Readiness, Alumni Support, Career Work, SEL, DEI work, things that you don't normally see funded through our state funds, but have an annual need to them. Next slide, please. Then the, there's the other side of the coin. There's the capital campaign need, which, as I mentioned before, we kind of lump the two together and we try to be really uh, a little bit more pure to what a capital campaign is, which is really a one time capital investment of um, a building or um, some materials that we'll need. And we predict that will be 11 to 15 million dollars over the next five years to support the current strategic plan. Next slide. You skipped one little bit. Thank you. Um, so again, this is the capital campaign. This is what we are going to need to raise over the five year period. It's $13.8 million. It's to support things like books and libraries, the new restorative rooms uh, that uh, Dr. Gasco has been working on, um, a new track at Uplift Hampton that the board approved earlier this year, the Uplift Crescendo Primary, the new Luna Campus, um, Pre-K at gratis, some upgrades to promote family participation, and then uh, staff wellness rooms that Dr. Gasco has been promoting. Next slide, please. So you'll see um, the number that we have for next year's budget, and whenever you approve the budget in June, you will see this line item in there. It's seven million dollars. It's a combination again of the annual giving piece and the capital campaign piece. And we look forward to working with each of you to just ensure we hit that goal. Um, as John said, we have a real healthy list of funders that have supported us along the way, but uh, we can't take them for granted. We always need new folks and we also need our board to engage with our existing folks so they know that our board is committed also to funding the work of Uplift. Happy to take any questions or John, if you have anything to add. And let me just make one comment on annual fund. It, it also gives us an opportunity to tell the uplift story. If you're hitting up a friend or an associate or someone you work with and, and, and it doesn't have to be a big gift. If you're trying to get $100 or $500 out of somebody and, and they ask, why should I do it? And that, that kind of elevator pitch on this is what we're doing in our community is maybe more important winning over one person than the dollars that may follow that ask. So uh, it is, is definitely tied to the long term health of the organization, both in terms of finances, but also in terms of just the public's accept, acceptance of what we're doing. So uh, we're excited about jumping into it full speed ahead next year. Thank you, Deborah. Deborah, this is Pilar Davies. I have a question about the Luna campus. Why do we need a new? What's happening with that, that we need a new campus? Sure, so I, I'm not, I'm thinking that the board's been brief. Maybe it was just the executive committee, um, but we are looking to potentially relocate Uplift Luna K-12 to a piece of property in East Dallas, closer to Uplift White Rock Hills that would accommodate a full K through 12 campus that would include play fields, playgrounds, um, a full size UIL regulated gym. Um, and so we're still pursuing that opportunity. And if we move forward with that, we will need some additional operating funds to close the capital um, gap there on that project. And Yasmin, I don't know if you want to speak more to that. Are you yes, I'm, Pilar, the, I'm, I'm sorry, Pilar, go ahead. No, are you selling the campus, the, the existing yes. campus? Yes, so that's what I was going to mention, Pilar. Um, uh, we received an unsolicited, very generous offer for the secondary campus uh, and realized we were sitting on one of the last large tracts of land slash property. Obviously, we have a building on it in Deep Ellum. We cannot transact on the site until we've closed on the new site for Luna to go to because obviously we need to time everything where the kids go from one campus to the next. So it's a couple of year endeavor and we've been working closely to get city uh, approval on the new site and then we can do the the actions on the current buildings. 
about it. Thank you. And I mean, I'm happy to connect offline and, and share more details. Great, awesome. Any other questions for um, Deborah no, or John? I, yeah, I was just gonna uh, just make a comment again. Uh, John and Deborah, great job on pulling this together. I think in the past, we've certainly as an organization been very focused on the building campaign, the capital campaign. And I think to broaden our perspective and to think about some of the programming that we have that aren't covered by our school dollars, John has done a really good job with Deborah to to really kind of hone in on how to uh, work the annual funds and has come back to a number of times kind of rejiggering it and making sure we're all committed toward the same goal. So I think uh, great, great job. Thanks. Great. OK, Richard, I am up next and I'm excited to get your input uh, on our proposed use of our ESSER 3 funds. Uh, we've been doing a ton of stakeholder engagement over the past two weeks. So if you'll bear with me, I'm gonna walk through a set of slides pretty quickly in terms of our proposed plan and what feedback we've been hearing from staff, leaders, kids, and parents, and then open it up for discussion and questions from you all. So Alex, next slide, please. So as I shared, past two weeks have been a ton of stakeholder input. We've engaged our entire leadership team. I've done staff town halls. We issued a parent survey. We've issued scholar surveys. I hosted a parent town hall yesterday over lunch, and we'll host another one in the evening on Thursday. And then of course we have the opportunity to get your thoughts on it. So as a friendly reminder about the ESSER funds, this was just an incredible opportunity that we are truly grateful for. Um, uh, as part of the American Rescue Plan Act, um, or ESSER 3 as we call it, since we've received ESSER 1 funds, um, we will get an additional $35 million over three years of stimulus funds from the federal government. We have to apply for these funds from TEA uh, in mid-June, and then we'll get them this summer. They are three years of funds, and then they go away. So, of course, we're being incredibly mindful of what we direct them towards as we want to make sure that any expenses we take on, we can continue to support beyond this three-year period. Of course, the intention of the funds is to accelerate learning coming out of the pandemic and handling any um, costs associated with uh, reopening schools to full capacity. So that's the context of this. As part of our TA application, we are required to show all the various stakeholder input that we received, and, and obviously we wanted to get stakeholder impact, input anyway during this process. So I'm going to walk through the five proposed investment themes, um, there are two slides that cover this, uh, and they are um, uh, the first one being deep focus on staff retention through competitive compensation. Uh, we knew that we were behind market in several core role types uh, across the network, and we believe that to recover strongly coming out of the pandemic, it is critical that we have our highest performing leaders, teachers, support staff for our schools uh, who are there as who know the uplift way and are a consistent presence ready to go uh, as we come out uh, of the pandemic into a more normal school year next year. This would be one of the largest uses of the funds. The second priority theme is around investing in teacher capacity building again. Um, our teachers are going to have to build new skills to be able to close the gap faster for our kids and accelerate learning. And we want to make sure that we are uh, investing in building our teachers capacity in very intentional ways. The third area here is pretty interesting, and maybe some of you might have done this with your own children. I know Richard and Cullum and I were talking about how we've done it for our own kids um, uh, is investing in an army, I don't know a better word to use, of contract tutors for um, uh, both math and reading uh, that um, we can use. And I know it says reading here, but it's actually we now looking at our recent star data that we'll go into more detail on in June with you all. We see an opportunity in math as well um, to basically be able to offer during the school day 
high frequency, high quality, small group tutoring. So imagine groups of three to four students being pulled similar to how a family might hire a private tutor and to have two to three times a week for 30 minutes each where they are specifically working on what those that small group of children need to be working on uh, to make sure that we are catching up kids as quickly as possible. Our early look at our data shows the gaps are tremendous um, uh, from the past 15 months and we want to give kids as many personalized as bats as possible to recover and then obviously an expense like this could go away at, um, at the end of the three-year period because we'd use contract labor to do it. Next slide please. Uh, so then um, uh, the fourth piece is we, you know, our intention is that the almost all of our kids are back with us in person for the upcoming school year. And we want to make sure we reinvest kids in their school experience. And part of that is the joy of the environment and investing in our enrichment activities. This has been a place where we've really sought scholar and family input for their specific school. What are the enrichment programs, whether that's a specific sport, arts, um, uh, debate, um, uh, robotics, what is it that their family or their school community is excited about building as a center of excellence uh, to really make sure that kids and families are invested back again in an in-person learning environment. Again, that can be treated as a distinct investment. And then lastly, we, we are awaiting a final legislative decision on whether or not school districts will be allowed to offer any form of virtual learning for next school year. We believe the numbers will be very small for this if we are allowed to offer it, um, but we also want to keep kids in our network for a very long time and have a long relationship with them. And so recognizing a small set of families might still need this as an option for one more year. We do not want to have each individual school offer virtual learning, but rather consolidate all those students interested into a network virtual school. And we know there will be expenses uh, in order to run that. So we want to placeholder some of our ESSER funds. So if we see coming out of the legislative session that we see families have interest and this is something we want to offer, um, we already have the dollars ready to go to hire a set of teachers that would teach just our virtual kids at the Uplift Virtual Academy um, for next school year. So those are the five investment themes we've been testing with our stakeholders. Competitive compensation for key roles across the network to have strong retention, external capacity building, high dose, high quality, high frequency uh, tutoring uh, during the school day for math and reading, enrichment programming, and virtual school support if we need it. So here's what um, our stakeholders have told us so far. Next slide, please. Thank you. So you can see here, um, uh, and again, you'll see this is actually fairly consistent across stakeholder groups. Folks like these five planks, um, uh, and that has been a real positive to see, um, and you can see it here. Um, uh, just as a FYI, uh, one of the pieces of feedback that we got around compensation is we, for some specific role groups, including teachers and school leaders, we went in and early on gave them a retention bonus to return for next year. We did not have the financial ability at that time to expand it to a broader set of staff. We now do and we'll be rolling that out. So that's now part of our proposed amended budget to close out this fiscal year. So it came up early on in our stakeholder engagement as we were figuring out really what our final finances would be for this year. So that has already um, been incorporated in. But as you can see, um, just lots of positives in terms of what uh, folks were interested in. Next slide, please. Staff similarly, you can see very consistent um, with our leaders um, in terms of the things that they like. Again, you know, compensation came up as everyone wants to know how are they personally impacted by it. We also um, saw some specificity about what kind of professional development uh, that they would want to have, and that was great to see as we 
uh, figure out how we would prioritize that professional training bucket for our teachers. And then we are incorporating in this great suggestion about in our enrichment funds for kids, adding some enrichment dollars for family engagement that are school specific, that our parent groups could use uh, for deeper engagement inside their school community. And that's, it's honestly a very low dollar amount and that's an easy add that we will make to our proposed application. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of, we asked our parents, you know, what matters most to you about your child's school experience? And you can see the responses here. And first and foremost, it's quality teachers. Our, our parents tell us they care about the retention of our staff. And so that's why we saw a lot of support on making sure that compensation is not a barrier to us keeping our staff. We also realize with all districts now having an inflow of federal dollars, the war for talent is probably the most aggressive I've seen it uh, in my decade now at Uplift. Um, it was also nice to see that career and college, uh, which is a core part of our value proposition, matter to our families. Next slide, please. Uh, this is from a parent perspective. We asked, you know, where do you want to see investments in enrichment programming? Sports was overwhelming with robotics being second. And it was interesting that when we asked specifically about which sports they wanted to see as real points of excellence, we saw soccer, basketball, and baseball slash softball. That's baseball slash softball is a new one. Um, and there's lots of community fields that have been built near our schools. So, um, it'll be interesting to see how that continues to shape out as we continue to get feedback from our parent and scholar communities. Next slide, please. Uh, we asked parents as we engage more with you, uh, where would you like to have support? And you can see here their response, help with homework, help managing the social emotional needs of their children and the college process were the top three. And so this is really important information for us as again, we use some of those enrichment dollars to better engage our families across the network. Next slide. Um, and so again, here you can see the parent feedback. It is super consistent. People are excited about investments in enrichment, small group tutoring, increased compensation. Um, uh, and you see that some of the things that might be missing actually mirror uh, the staff feedback about making sure there was additional family engagement supports, which again, we will add into our programming. Um, and then lots of interest in our summer programming as well, which we have already funded uh, through some earlier dollars uh, that we received. Uh, and then this last one I thought was interesting about really making sure we're being intentional and welcoming our scholars back with so many of students in our network who were virtual for the past you know, 15 months now. Uh, so, and, and of course we're taking that into account. So that, those were uh, the, some of the feedback that we got from parents. And then we'll see what our um, kids said. Uh, and so we asked our kids what mattered to them. And I loved seeing quality guidance on college and career. And then of course, teachers, they were completely aligned to their parents. They were separately asked. Uh, and we saw those being the top three things, which was great. And they were virtually the same. So it was really nice to see that alignment with our families and our kids. Next slide, Alex. Uh, kids also are super interested in sports. Robotics was in the top three. It didn't spike as much as it did with parents, um, but it was great to see again that consistency there. Uh, kids also, of course, have thoughts when we ask them what can make your school experience even better. They want to talk about getting rid of uniforms, so you know, we'll, we'll continue to explore that. Uh, and of course, more freedoms and cell phone usage. I'd like to take all technology away uh, after this year we've been in, but you know, we honor their feedback uh, and it was great to just give them an opportunity to have voice. We sent a survey to every middle and high school scholar and asked them for their input. So uh, we will, we're cutting this data by school and giving it to each school leader for them to have and to continue to work with, with their school community. Great, so where are we next? Um, uh, 
we will now take this stakeholder input, refine our draft plans that I just shared with you. Like I said, we're making reading tutoring being both reading and math. We are um, expanding enrichment to be not just scholar focused, but also increased parent engagement. Um, uh, we'll assign a formal budget to items and uh, submit that uh, to the TEA. We'll give campuses their specific survey results so they can start the summer um, doing their own individual uh, planning that they need to do. So that's where we are. Um, and I'd love to now open it up to hear any feedback or comments you have on what our stakeholders shared and our proposed five investment themes, which again are competitive compensation to drive staff retention, external capacity building of staff, support of a virtual school if needed, enrichment programming, and um, small group uh, high dose tutoring during the school day for math and reading for the scholars who are most behind. Yes, yeah. this is our um, quick question about, I think a while back we introduced a pilot program around social emotional learning and It'd be great at some point just to get an update, just because in the survey it seemed like that was one of the top three um, that was that there was some interest in. My friend Dr. Gasco is going to be giving the board a quick update on that just shortly. Literally, I think he's up after me. Oh, wonderful. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Not just yet, Alex, but we'll. <laughs> but he is coming up next. <laughs> Alex is like, you're done, Yasmin. <laughs> I got you, Ardo. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, I'm curious awesome, other you. people's reactions to our proposed five investment themes or any thoughts on the feedback we got from stakeholders. Well, this is this, Richard. I, one, I think it's extremely comprehensive. Two, it, it covers clearly a lot of the bases because you had the, the input of all the different stakeholders. Um, you know, I, th I think the, the, the bigger concern is with all the moving parts, you know, how do you actually launch it all? Uh, some of it sounds like it, it could be, I guess the good news is you're, you're going to have dollars to spend to launch it. And it's just a matter of, of taking the resources that you have at hand and, and, and dedicating them to, you know, owning the different things that need to be, you know, supported, whether it's, you know, all of a sudden coming up with a virtual, you know, so I, I think it's interesting. I, I think you've, it's been very well laid out. And, and, and then I guess the last thing would be is just some of them you still have some choices to make as to, you know, you know, which areas you want, which sports or which, which activities you want to do and whether they're different from school to school or whether they're all the same. So it just sounds like a, a lot of a lot of moving parts. Uh, but fortunately, you have a lot of dollars at hand and, 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 a, and a team behind you to, to help make it happen. It sounds like everybody's excited about it. Yeah, I think, Richard, the most complicated part of this will honestly um, be the high dose, high frequency, uh, high quality tutoring pieces and getting that launched across every school, developing the criteria of which kids participate and honestly just getting all of those tutors uh, signed up appropriately, you know, aligned and normed about what we want that support to look like. So we've already started in parallel doing our research, engaging TA on how they're thinking about it, what support they can provide. So you know, we're not waiting for our application to be approved. We're doing some of this planning in parallel. Yasmin, where's the pool of tutors coming from? Yeah, that's a, a great question, Pilar. And that's what we're actually figuring out. So the state, I was just trading notes with someone pretty senior on Morath's team today. They are actually vetting tutoring organizations to see which ones they would recommend where a district could actually partner with the uh, organization and then provided tutors for us. Um, we obviously could go out and contract with our own tutors. Like you could imagine there were teachers who opted out of the profession because of COVID and might be interested in coming back, you know, and working with small groups of students throughout the day. So 
I don't have that definitive answer for you yet. That's part of this detailed planning of what is the best way of sourcing the tutors. Um, but I think we have a couple of different options uh, that that are a, a possibility. OK, well, if you have any other feedback, I'm going to send out the entire presentation deck after our meeting. Please just feel free to shoot me a note or we can hop on the phone. I'm happy to uh, cover, you know, have uh, any further discussions. And then as we get our grant approved, we'll continue to give you all updates uh, on how we are, uh, how the planning is unfolding. Hey, Yasmin, this is Richard. One other quick question. Sure. Uh, virtual school. And, and kind of the legislative, it, just from kind of the recent announcements, it's, it seems like it's more likely than not that they would not want to do it unless for some reason they give you an out because a certain number of students fit certain criteria where, you know, an in, in school session may not be best for them. But is there any color you have or thoughts you have as to how that might play out? Sure, and Eric is going to give an advocacy update at the end of this meeting and literally the virtual school bill that has just been sitting dormant for the past couple of weeks has you know, with five days left of the session has now picked up momentum. And so we um, uh, literally I told Eric my homework item for tonight is to read through the proposed bill and offer any of the suggestions we have on it as this thing well, I think something's going to happen with it over the next uh, couple of days because everyone's looking for guidance on virtual school. So the short answer is it's been pretty quiet on it. And now in the final days, it's picking up. And I do expect we will get approval. There will be some guidance that was given by the legislature um, in these final days on virtual school. My intention is that as few children as possible participated. And I think we have seen from our early data that our kids need to be with us in person. Though I do appreciate that until all of our primary school kids have the opportunity to get vaccinated, there could be a set of children who we want to continue to serve who need to be in a virtual setting. And so it's just a little bit of this dance right now. Yeah. But we're paying close attention to it. OK. I think it's Dr. Gasco's turn. Thanks, Yasmin. Hi, everybody. It's good to be with you. Um, I'm going to provide you with an update on our staff and scholar and well-being work. I'll tell you a bit more about the frame of well-being and what that means as a sort of theme for efforts that have been underway this year and what we're proposing heading into the next school year is sort of trying to be really helpful partners with uh, all of our collective departments and schools and families uh, and community partners to think about uh, recovering scholars not only getting them back to school um, but sort of helping them uh, sort of recover a mindset um, or a predisposition to learning and growth um, so that they can be successful and then sort of helping to restore um, you know, what needs to be restored based on all that may have happened to them uh, this past year. I want to ground us in a, a sort of simple definition. We know that trauma uh, is alive and well, and it's something that we've all thought about, perhaps been impacted by, uh, whether directly or indirectly over the past 18 months. And so just to simplify, uh, you know, trauma is sort of generally this sense of overwhelm. Um, whether, you know, your life has been threatened or life of somebody that you care for. And it's it typically, if you look at the diagram on the left, is sort of, it, it's the intersection of stress in one's life, distress and exposure to, to distress and just sort of ongoing adversity. And the more sort of acute uh, these events and experiences are, the more that trauma uh, can literally take over and overwhelm uh, someone's life. And so I've added a dimension here I'll go into in a moment called resilience. And resilience is super important when it comes to trauma. You can go back one slide, please. Um, because the degree to which one's resiliency can be um, sort of supported in the midst of all of what we're facing, the better. Um, you know, our scholars, our staff and others will be able to to have the protective factors that they need to be successful. 
Next slide. And so I just want to talk about something called allostatic load. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time lecturing you on, on science, but this one is really important. And I think what I would argue is um, even prior to the pandemic, the conditions and the background experiences that our scholars bring to their learning, they already are operating at a high allosta allostatic load. And what that means is the stress that they have or have experienced in their life and then uh, any adverse childhood experiences, which we know are prevalent, um, the more that those factors sort of um, interact with each other, um, uh, and then taking into account their uh, proactive resilience factors or their uh, inability to have resilience really determines the degree to which um, we are vulnerable to illness or disease or struggle. And so part of our work has been to um, decrease allostatic load across our network by offering proactive ways to talk about and support well-being, social emotional competence, uh, mental health, physical health, uh, et cetera. So we can't get an exact fix on what our number would be, but no doubt, as you can imagine, the allostatic load that has happened cumulatively over the last 18 months that we will fully receive when we recover. Our scholars in person in the fall will be significantly higher uh, than uh, ordinary times. Next slide. So I wanted to give you um, an update about how we've thought about the integration of our work uh, on the well-being team. And so we really see the work that we do as support work. Um, and, and what we've worked hard to do is not work in silos, um, but to think about our work as being interdependent. Um, so if you look at the diagram, you can see uh, the center obviously is our goal of integration and sort of the um, shapes around starting from staff well-being, mental health, health. We, we have put together supports in a more integrated way because for us to hit a home run and support learning and uh, both academic and social emotional learning and then really help accelerate our scholars and families toward their preferred future. You know, we've got to do a good job um, creating the conditions so that students feel like they belong. Uh, relationships and social connections are prevalent. Um, we provide safety and security, purpose and meaning, and then these sort of really important um, areas of flourishing and healing is, is part and parcel of what we do. So um, to take you back in time, I began uh, with Uplift in November 2019 and had a few months in the role and then you know what happened. And so what we've done is we've had to accelerate our model to sort of immediately begin to address uh, what we've seen across the network um, in terms of scholar need and family need, but not lose sight of our goal to, to truly create a team that um, you know, provides a proactive protective force in the network so that um, you know, our scholars can truly thrive. Next slide, please. So I want to, there's a lot on this slide and I'm not going to go through all the bullets, but I'm really proud of the work that the well-being team has done over the past year in collaboration with others. You know, despite the setbacks and the adversity, we actually were able to do quite a bit. Um, I, I would point out the fourth bullet. I would highlight our health services team as really doing work that um, <laughs> few have come close to in the state, much less probably the country. And so we were not only on the front lines of advanced and proactive screening through a luminaire system, you know, collaboration with our ops team, we were able to create really incredible uh, ways to, you know, have safe routines and, and distancing uh, in our schools. But we were also one of the few first districts in the state and the country to proactively start vaccinating. Um, and so I would say, you know, if to harken back to the previous diagram, creating the protective conditions of safety and security, I really would highlight this is a huge win um, among our team. As you can see, you know, we we um, rolled out a, a variety of other things um, that we think are going to be were important this year in helping our scholars stabilize uh, the conditions so that they could maximize their learning. We learned a lot 
Um, so uh, for this coming year, we, we've got some more ambitious goals. We'll continue to do a lot of, of what we've done. Um, I would say one huge win is we now have a bona fide social emotional learning pipeline um, from a curriculum perspective that we haven't had in the past. And so from pre-K through 12, we have an aligned set of curriculum and experiences that um, we are going to provide support to schools to help achieve so that learning can um, thrive. Uh, a few highlights I would make on the sort of column to your right for this coming school year um, is we, we are really taking um, seriously the call to equity and justice. Um, and so as part of your commitment um, as a board, we have uh, done our work to really help reimagine, um, you know, restorative approaches to scholar personal responsibility versus disciplining. You know, communities of color historically have been disciplined for a long time, and so we're trying to eradicate, um, you know, some of the language that has often been used in schools uh, to make sure that our work uh, across our schools is really about helping scholars you know uh, maximize personal responsibility amidst all that they need to do and when they fall help elevate them or restore them back to a level of decision making that's mature uh, where they learn um, so we're also rolling out the fourth bullet a really exciting uh, character education um, approach that sort of activates our IB, what we call our IB um, learner attribute model. Um, so we received a generous grant recently from the Kern Family Foundation, a million dollars over the next three years to do some really incredible work. So, you know, we want to create this base level of SEL competency for all of our scholars. We want to create on top of that really healthy ways to go about uh, supporting scholars to make good decisions and when they fall to help them achieve um, sort of personal responsibility in healthy ways and equitable ways and at the same time we want to help them grow toward a deeper uh, north star which is around their own character uh, because we think in the long run that's going to help set them up to truly change the world which uh, we 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 are trying to help set them up to do so we're doing a variety of other things. The last thing I'll highlight before going to uh, my closing is we've thought long and hard about how to truly scale an employee or staff based well-being program. And, and so one of the things my team and I have done is really uh, researched across the country. What are some of the best ways that companies and you know, for profit and nonprofit organizations really support um, staff well-being, and, and we found um, a really, a really incredible program called LifeWorks. Uh, and LifeWorks is being used by some of the best companies in America. But what it does is, if you think about the poles of uh, a staff person's experience, the two extremes would be: sometimes we can find ourselves in despair, and sometimes we can find our, ourselves in joy. And so most what are called employee assistance programs really are centered on the pole of despair and how do we help people who are in despair who are hurting or who need help um, really rapidly but they don't necessarily do a good job of helping staff row and achieve the other shore which is human flourishing and so we believe we found i use tesla you could use your preferred car of choice um, they're uh, an employee well-being program that will really help us scale a different way uh, to enable uh, staff to choose their own well-being and support that. Uh, lastly, um, we're going to create a well-being concierge system. If you think about, um, you know, uh, when you go to a hotel and you have a concierge service, we know that this new employee well-being program is going to generate a lot of questions and interests. And so we're going to create a, a ticketing I help system so that we can proactively support people on their journeys without sort of directing what that journey should be. So we're excited about it. Uh, next slide, please. Lastly, um, we've been putting a lot of thought about preferred outcomes. Um, clearly, um, you know, uh, academic learning is what we're all about as well. And, and we 
we um, really see ourselves as being part, uh, uh, part and parcel of that. But the whole scholar um, really stands out as something we're really rowing toward. And so if you look across the different interdependent um, aspects of, of our support model, um, we, we want to really work toward um, improving health and food inequalities uh, on the health side. Counseling, we want to be proactive. Counseling is one of those areas where we want, we want to proactively build relationships with scholars, especially those we know are in distress. But we also have to react often um, as need arise. So we want to make sure that our response is of exceptional quality uh, and that we're both proactive and responsive as need be. From an SEL perspective, we're going to be working this summer uh, to set uh, targets uh, going into next year is what kind of belonging do we want to engender uh, so that scholars really uh, we can act, help activate that joy factor where they really want to be with us and learn and grow and thrive and we want to keep them long term so scholar retention is really important to us two more to go and i'll close um, this restorative personal responsibility again we we're trying to move away from the language of disciplining uh, to the language of personal responsibility and character that uh, we believe that gets us farther on a journey uh, so we're going to be piloting new ways to help scholars who have made poor choices uh, learn from them um, and we're so we're going to be piloting a new in-school suspension program we we'll probably won't call it that anymore uh, and we also will be looking to reduce out of school suspensions by really helping to proactively support our campus teams to 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 really have a restorative approach to uh, personal responsibility in, in a perfect world we want to completely eradicate expulsion. So that's not even a consideration. We know sometimes that arises legally, uh, but we want to really make sure that uh, from a personal responsibility perspective, uh, we're doing things different. Um, and finally, from a staff well-being perspective, uh, we want to really get 2,500 employees signed up. Um, this is a digital system. Um, where you get an app and you get a personalized experience. We want everybody using LifeWorks. Uh, and then we really want to work together with all of our other divisions to make sure that uh, our staff across the network feel valued um, and, and, and stay with us for, for as long as possible. I know I've given you a lot of information. My hope was to provide you with an update as to the work that's been done. Uh, over the past year and, and where we're headed in the future and over the summer again we'll be putting more thought into what our exact performance targets will look like for next year thank you john and just um to let the board know you know when obviously our staff was very excited about the different compensation changes that we've made and rolled out but we are really intentional about grounding that even in our broader value proposition, which includes our focus on the well-being of our staff, including their belonging and our equity work. So that way each individual colleague can bring their authentic self to the table. So we know financial security matters, but we want our staff to also know that their professional development, their overall well-being and their sense of identity are also collectively part of our value proposition of being at Uplift. I'm going to ask, you might have some questions for John, but I do want us to be able to transition and have the full amount of time with Anne and Jury. And so um, when I send out the deck, I'll include John's email address. And if you have any questions or comments for John, uh, please feel free to reach out to him directly and he will be happy to hop on the phone or trade any emails back. Thanks, Yasmin. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to have the time with you tonight and to share an update on our equity agenda. I'm also happy to have my colleague Jury here with me. Again, Jury is directly supporting my team with our work to create a multi-year plan to increase diversity at Uplift. Uh, Jury was the CPO for City Square for over a decade and is a true human resources and workforce development executive. She now runs uh, her own human resources consultancy, and we are grateful to have her perspective and her expertise at the table, too. OK, so before I begin, I want to share three objectives for my time together with you. Uh, the first is to provide a high level update on our equity agenda, specifically on the commitments made in the board letter regarding racial equity. 
Second, to provide a more focused update on the work of creating a multi-year plan to increase the diversity of our teachers and campus leadership teams. And then third, to preview where we're going from here. I will revisit this timeline at the end of my presentation, but do want to share now that we are preparing to engage the Strategic Planning Board Committee uh, in June. Uh, on our diversity plan. We're planning to, to then draft our initial set of objectives and strategies in July and to roll out our plan to the board and all our stakeholders in August. Uh, I have about 20 minutes of content and 10 minutes for questions and discussion tonight. I ask that you hold your questions to the extent possible for our discussion time to ensure that we have enough time to get through both. So. I want to start by acknowledging that today commemorates one year since the killing of George Floyd. As Uplift commits to amplifying voices and efforts to end systemic issues of racial and social injustices, I want to invite everyone right now to pause for a moment of silence. Thank you. As we close out the month of May and enter June, this also marks one year since you, the Uplift Board, wrote your letter regarding racial equity. In that letter, you boldly committed uh, Uplift to take action to continue driving equity, increasing diversity, and creating inclusion in our schools and workplace. Next slide. So over the next two slides, I have listed the commitments that were made in the board's letter regarding racial equity, and I've marked each with a visual indicator of progress. So uh, the green stoplight indicates that that work is complete or fully operationalized. The yellow stoplight indicates the work has started and is still in progress. Red indicates that we have not yet begun to take action. So on this first slide, uh, you can see that we're green with creating a detailed plan. You've seen this and analyzing performance data through a racial equity lens. This is something that we've been able to integrate into our equity dashboard. We've taken steps to start the work uh, on adding budgetary resources to support black scholars with things like adding the track at Uplift Hampton, reevaluating curriculum and implementing innovative instructional practices. We've done quite a bit of work with our teachers this year around culturally responsive teaching uh, and analyzing our student attrition data to take action to retain our black scholars. This is something our family engagement team has been uh, conducting analysis on this year, and this is actually something that we will be looking at next month as part of our diversity efforts too. Next slide. So uh, you'll see that we we also have given ourselves a green light uh, with spending time with our black student associations during the first quarter to hear more about their experiences. This was something that Yasmin did in her town halls that she conducted this fall. We started and are continuing to work to develop a multi year plan to increase diversity. This is what I'm going to dive deeper into in just a couple of minutes. Uh, to increase training on restorative discipline practices. John just shared his update. That work has definitely started and is off the ground with our well-being and SEL department, and that's going to continue into the summer and next school year. Uh, we've also uh, given ourselves the green light with supporting the investment and in expanding parent engagement. Uh, you guys know that we've redesigned our family engagement arm and we're continuing to create channels for parent voice at the campus level. Uh, and then also uh, we are a work in progress with engaging our funding community in those candid conversations to secure resources uh, in areas that are most critical for us to continue driving racial equity. So my team has been charged with operationalizing the specific commitment around creating a three year plan to increase the diversity of the leadership team and teaching staff, uh, specifically noting the importance of students being able to see people who look like them when they come to school. So it's for this reason that I am going to focus in on this one aspect of our equity agenda tonight. This, however, is one of many actions that we are taking as an organization to drive equity, increase diversity and be more inclusive. And many of these actions are interconnected. Next slide. So the, the commitments in the board letter uh, are aimed at increasing diversity, driving equity, and creating a sense of inclusion. I've shared this graphic with you, but these three concepts, they're all present in our broader equity agenda, yet they are distinct from one another. And we have defined what each of these mean for us at Uplift. 
So we believe that diversity is about a collective or group and can only exist in relationship to others. It's the mix of who we have across teams, departments, schools, and across the organization. This is what we consider our numbers work. We believe equity is a process that begins by acknowledging the reality of an unequal starting place and continues by addressing the imbalance. This is what we believe we need to impact through our systems work. Last, we believe inclusion is the sense that all are welcome, all can grow, all can contribute regardless of their identity. We see this as our culture work. Next slide. So our efforts to increase diversity, drive equity, and create a strong sense of inclusion, they show up in our strategic priorities. Specifically, they show up in our academic plank uh, with our priority around addressing racial and language disparities in our academic data. It also shows up in our talent plank with our priority around examining systems and processes to ensure that they are equitable and inclusive. And it shows up in our culture brand, uh, our culture and brand base with our priority around scholars, family and staff feeling a sense of belonging. We're continuing to think more deeply about how we can explicitly connect our DEI work back to our strategic priorities and goals. And this is something that we plan to revisit with you in the board retreat this August. Next slide. OK, so with that, I'm going to zoom in on the work we've done so far to create a long term plan to increase diversity. When this charge was given to me and my team, we realized pretty quickly that we needed a process to ensure we spent enough time. One, wrestling with our principles, getting really clear on what diversity data points matter to us, why and how they connect back to our broader mission and goals, and then two, conducting analysis to understand what our current mix is and how we can contextualize this. How does it look comparatively when we look at educator demographic data before we jumped straight to action? The time we've taken this spring and this first, but I would consider pretty exploratory phase of the planning process will allow us to more confidently move into the next phase, uh, which we're going to be entering into this summer, which includes setting clear objectives, naming what we want to move the needle on and over what period of time and articulating our strategy. What are we going to do to help us get there uh, this summer? So our goal is to have a draft of objectives and strategies by late July, early August that we can share with you, our staff and our families. Uh, and that we will begin implementing in the 21-22 school year. So with that, uh, I'm going to pivot now to share more detail about what we've done and what we've learned so far uh, this spring. So our work in this space, it is iterative. We're continuously moving from acknowledgement to awareness to action. Um, I would consider your letter, the board's letter regarding racial equity and the public commitment to create a long term plan to increase diversity. That was acknowledgement uh, over the last few months. We've built awareness by doing three key things. One, we reviewed the literature to understand the impact of diversity in the K-12 environment and surface connections to student achievement and our broader organizational goals. The second thing we've done is we reviewed baseline qualitative and quantitative data. Uh, looking specifically at racial diversity and language diversity data to start. While there are many points of diversity that we can look at, all of which matter, racial diversity and language diversity felt like the most foundational data points to begin with, and two that tie explicitly back to our mission and broader organizational goals. The third thing that we've done is we've connected with a lot of different stakeholders. So while my team is driving this work forward, we're definitely not doing it alone. Uh, we socialized our findings with the Uplift Culture Committee. I have met with every campus leadership team, uh, and we've also had a chance to socialize some of this with our Strategic Planning Board Committee. Uh, so we are uh, eager and committed to including uh, uh, an array of voices um, and also uh, are going to share some of the reactions tonight of what we heard when we were sharing with others what we have been seeing and what we have been learning. So now we're preparing to take action by way of setting clear goals and articulating what strategies we will implement. Again, this process is cyclical. And as we start taking action, we're going to continue getting new information and widening the aperture through which we see this work. So uh, we do not enter into this work having all the answers, but we will learn more and more as we go. If we're doing this well, it will continue to be an iterative process. So um, I encourage you and all of us uh, to be OK with this and to just lean into the unknowns. OK, so 
in our building awareness uh, through reviewing the literature, looking at the data and talking with, st with stakeholders, there were a few thematic things that came to the, the surface. The first was the, ra that the racial and ethnic differences that exist in the pipeline of American teachers. So at a national level, there are disparities between the racial composition of American children and what we see with the American teaching force. Uh, in a 2015 study that you that was using data from the American Community Survey, it was determined that just over half of American children uh, aged five to 17 were white, but nearly 80% of young teachers uh, defined as those between the ages of 25 and 34 uh, uh, were white. Meanwhile, while black students comprised about 13% of all school aged children, black teachers represented only around 8% of all young teachers. And while Hispanic students comp comprised around 24% of all school aged children, Hispanic teachers only represented around 9% of all young teachers. Asian teachers were slightly more underrepresented relative to the percentage of Asian students in the population. So when you look at where these gaps emerge in the pipeline for teachers, you see it starting at looking at high school graduation rates. You see it continue looking at college graduation rates, and then you see it at one step further, the rates at which college students are deciding to enter the teaching workforce. Um, so, uh, you know, high school graduation rates uh, are the highest uh, among uh, Asian young adults, uh, followed by white young adults, followed by black young adults, followed by Hispanic young adults. When we look at college graduation rates, the racial and ethnic gaps in college degree attainment are even more stark uh, because the, the, the percent of young adults who are getting their college degree is much lower. 65% uh, of Asian young adults holding bachelor's degree, 40% of white young adults, 21% of black young adults, and 16% of Hispanic young adults. So when you think about this, right, a bachelor's degree is almost inevitably required for teaching. So these bachelor degree completion gaps make it a lot harder to achieve a teaching force whose diversity mirrors that of the student population. It was interesting to also see in the research, again, one step further, but who is deciding once they get their college degree to become a teacher? So uh, we see that there is the highest rate amongst uh, white young adults going into the teaching profession, uh, followed by black, followed by Hispanic, and then with the lowest rate being amongst Asian young adults. So I share these statistics with you just to paint some color and context around the systemic pressures that exist on teacher pipelines. Uh, these stem from systemic educational inequities, and we really believe that our work to increase the diversity in our teaching force is very interconnected with our mission and commitment to support students through college and career. Um, last, the literature also suggests that there's a link between black and Hispanic teacher recruitment and retention and black and brown scholar achievement and success. We're going to go into this in a bit more detail when we share what we've learned around this concept of same race matching between students and teachers. OK, so this this slide that I have up for you now uh, shows our aggregate teacher racial demographic data uh, and uh, it, it helps us contextualize our uplift data and also illuminate the racial and ethnic differences in pipeline and makeup of teachers. So this chart that you have here shows uh, the racial diversity across all teachers at uplift. Uh, it's about 1350 people uh, and then all teacher demographic data by county, state and national cuts. Uh, the data came from RHRIS, from TEA and from the National Center for Education Statistics. Uh, the National Center for Education Statistics uh, categorized the data in the exact terms that we copied and pasted into this chart that you're looking at this evening. So I shared this data with every campus leadership team and when I socialized the data with folks, a few things came up. Uh, as far as just reactions to the data, there was some surprise and appreciation for the relatively healthy overall distributions at Uplift in comparison to the distributions and the other cuts of the data. There was also some surprise uh, at the skewed representation of white teachers looking at Tarrant County and the national data cuts. There also was an observation of the higher Hispanic representation amongst teachers in Dallas County and Texas versus what we see at Uplift. Something that we acknowledged was that, you know, the data tells us what the mix is at this point in time. We pulled this data in January of 2021. Uh, it doesn't tell us how it's potentially changed over time. 
doesn't tell us how it compares uh, with our candidate pools and thinking about who we're attracting and who we're hiring uh, or our retention data, right? Who's staying and who's leaving. It also doesn't tell us what the connection or the comparison is between who is here and teacher evaluation and performance. So it doesn't tell the whole story. It tells us what is though. Uh, and some key takeaways that we had in looking at this is that there is good news to celebrate in looking at the overall racial diversity data, but there is also a, a clear opportunity for us to increase our Hispanic teacher representation. So uh, through reviewing the literature, looking at the data and talking with stakeholders, the second thematic theme that really came to the surface for us was the importance of students of color having access to same race teachers. Uh, there's a growing body of literature that suggests that outcomes such as test scores, attendance, suspension rates are all affected by the demographic match between teachers and students. Uh, research suggests that same race matches between students and teachers are associated with greater student achievement, with effects being stronger among low performing black students. It also suggests that teachers are more likely to view students' behaviors and prospects in a positive light. Uh, and last, the research also suggests that st students having access to a same race teacher also impacts the likelihood of the student deciding to become a teacher when he or she enters the workforce, which I thought was particularly interesting. So this again illuminates just the interconnectedness of our work to increase diversity and our broader mission and commitment to see students to and through college. Um, the importance of having access to a same race teacher, this was something that came up with students and staff in town halls and in our campus leadership team meetings. I do want to name though that this sentiment was definitely expressed as a both and proposition. Uh, the notion that both having access to a same race teacher and being a part of a diverse community before leaving for college uh, was something that came up with students as well as with staff. I know and you probably remember from us sharing in years past that our alumni they have talked pretty openly uh, about the struggles in adjusting to a new environment when they go off to college and the lines of difference are sharper and more prevalent. Uh, I asked Daniel Gray, our Managing Director of College and Career, for an example of this, and she shared with me uh, about Tanya, a full-time freshman that we have right now at Lawrence University. Uh, she's majoring in psychology. She's got good grades. Uh, she is enrolled right now with an expected graduation date in spring of 2024. Uh, she's been attending in person uh, and she's also shared openly that she struggled uh, with imposter syndrome and in some of her courses, especially during group discussions and her alumni counselor has spent time coaching her on this. Uh, so she has a network of uplift alums and a good support system, but this is something that is real for many of our students when they go off and have to integrate into a new environment. Uh, I would say additionally, in talking with our campus leaders, this was something that came up in reflection and personal testimonies for many of our leaders of color uh, in sharing their own personal connections to this idea of having access to a same race teacher, but also wanting to have uh, access to and exposure to a diverse community and a diverse group of people. So this all led us to focus uh, not just on the overall mix of racial diversity, but also the explicit focus on how staff racial diversity compares to our scholar racial diversity. And we think that potentially a focus on same race matching could support our overall student achievement and goals around college and career. So with that, I'm going to pause here and I'm going to open it up to uh, my colleague Jury to share just a little bit more about what we gleaned from the research around same race teacher matching. Yes, thank you, Anne. Uh, good to be here with you all today and want to just amplify that I'm proud to support the work of Uplift and partnering with Anne and the team and that a lot of the research that we found in amplifying the importance of same race uh, teachers and also in how that impacts the recruitment and retention of specifically black and Hispanic teachers. And I want to call out the link to uh, Yasmin and Dr. Gaskell's presentation about retention and also around belonging because the research amplifies the messages that Black and Hispanic students receive, and also who's being said that I can be a teacher, I can see myself being in that profession, and that profession is going to benefit both me and the students who look like me. And so, um, as Ann said, we were we looked we looked at local and na national data. This data set right here came from the Brookings Institution 
and it just really calls out um, expectations and achievements and also trajectory for students of color, specifically in this data set looking at black students. And if we go to the next slide, we have some of the research um, that amplifies how that looks at Uplift. And so I'll allow Ann to speak to that. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, so uh, everyone on this slide, you can see the racial distributions for Uplift staff uh, overall highlighted in yellow in the top row and how that compares with racial distributions overall for Uplift students. Uh, this is highlighted in yellow in the bottom row. Overall, you see that we have more black and white staff than we do black and white students. We have less Hispanic staff than we do Hispanic students. In the gray rows in between, you can see the racial distributions by major staff group at Uplift. So you see we have campus leader, teacher, uh, campus support, which consists of TAs, resident teachers, instructional coordinators, campus support operations, and then we also pulled our CMO staff and our senior leadership staff. Looking at the racial distributions by role group, the distance between Hispanic staff representation and Hispanic scholar representation becomes more amplified when looking at instructional and leadership roles. While our overall mix of staff is relatively healthy with some bright spots for sure in looking at our Black or African American representation and our teacher and campus leader distributions, we do have gaps between our scholar majority representation of Hispanic and our staff representation in all areas besides our campus support operations. Uh, many of our campus ops positions do not require a degree uh, and or require speaking Spanish. We acknowledge this in looking at the distributions, but we also, however, think about the implications of students seeing people who look like them primarily in non-degree required roles. If one of our objectives is to increase the access that students have to a same race teacher, it will be necessary to increase our Hispanic Latinx representation. And we believe that a focus on ensuring students do have access to a same race teacher at different points in their K-12 experience could help us uh, in addressing the racial disparities in our student achievement data and also help us retain more students of color. OK, so uh, the third and final thematic thing that surfaced for us when we were reviewing the literature, the data and talking with stakeholders was the role of language uh, in creating a strong sense of inclusion. We know that having a teacher who speaks the same language as a student's family is something that matters. This came up in student town halls. This came up in the surveying that we did of students and families back in the spring of 2020. Uh, students want their parents to be able to converse and authentically connect with their teacher without always having to be or have a third party translator. So this is critical. We believe it's critical for the teacher parent relationship when the home language is something other than English. Uh, we also know that language barriers are a major detractor for uplift families whose primary home language is Spanish. This is cited as a reason for withdrawal. Uh, we see an opportunity to, possibly, to positively impact our goals around family engagement and student enrollment by focusing on language diversity. We also see an opportunity to alleviate the pressure uh, that's on our Spanish speaking staff today by uh, focusing on language diversity. Uh, the, the burden our Spanish speaking staff uh, feel to serve as a translator is something that came up in our staff town halls. Uh, and so with that, Jury, I'm going to turn it back over to you to share just a little bit more about what we saw in the research around language. Yes, when we looked at local and nat national data, there was an overwhelming um, degree of information and just elevating the importance of same language and same race teachers. When we talk about the experience, um, I know we're talking about belonging and, ex and experience for students and for teachers, and that experience is markedly different when a Hispanic student has someone who looks like them and someone who speaks the same language and and alluded to the impact that also has on the parent and the family experience in the education experience for the for the family. And also when we talk about teacher gaps, there is a lot of data around that, but we looked at a Washington Post, a, a really a great study the Washington Post did in 2019 around teacher gap. And it talked about just that the majority of Hispanic students in our country face teacher gaps in excess of 25%, and it's more than any other racial group in the country. And so, 
it really caused us and backed up um, the idea that we need to look very closely at the experience of Hispanic students and teachers, and also look at retention, recruitment and retention of more Hispanic and also the experience and the retention of black students, uh, black students and teachers as well. Thanks, Jerry. OK, so in this uh, third and final data slide uh, that I have for you guys tonight, here you can see uh, the the language distributions for uplift staff uh, overall highlighted in yellow in the top row and how that compares with the language distributions overall for uplift students in that highlighted row uh, at the bottom. Uh, overall, you'll see that close to about a third of our staff speak Spanish uh, as compared to a little less than half of our students whose primary home language home language is Spanish. Similarly to the last data cut in the gray rows in between, you can see the language distributions by major staff group at Uplift. Uh, so in this breakdown, we see a cascade of percentages that increase as you move from campus leader to teacher to support to operations. Um, uh, in sharing this data, uh, there was some sentiment of being pleasantly surprised to see close to 25% of our teachers speak Spanish uh, and just about a third of our campus support staff. Again, this includes TAs, residents, coordinators uh, speak Spanish as well. The number is a little bit higher than what we saw in our Hispanic representation. Of course, language and race don't necessarily go hand in hand, uh, but we thought uh, we, 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 we thought it may actually have been lower given that we don't currently offer bilingual instruction and we have not had a concerted effort yet uh, to attract and compensate Spanish speaking staff and uh, Spanish speaking instructional staff. Um, our highest concentration of Spanish speaking staff does sit within our campus support operations staff. I do again think it's worth noting here that many of our campus support positions like receptionist uh, have requirements around speaking Spanish written into the job description, uh, which influences uh, I think where we see it show up. Uh, and then of course at the central office level, we have about 25% of CMO staff and 15% of senior leaders who speak Spanish. So. All in all, we see an opportunity to both increase the representation of Spanish speaking staff, uh, particularly at the campus leader, senior leader and teacher level, uh, while simultaneously revamping our network wide translation services to mitigate the current language barriers that exist. So we believe that by focusing on language diversity, it can help us create a stronger sense of inclusion for our students and family who speak Spanish. Uh, and we believe that this ultimately will support our goals around family engagement and retention. So uh, the last thing I want to share with you is just revisiting uh, in a little bit more detail where we're going from here. So again, we've taken uh, the last few months to build awareness uh, around disparities in educator pipelines, the impact of same race matching between students and teachers and the role that language plays in creating an inclusive environment for our Spanish speaking staff and families. We're really looking forward uh, to now taking what we've learned and working with the strategic planning board committee next month uh, to dig more deeply both into our learnings, but also to dig a bit more deeply into our data. Uh, so in our working sessions, we plan to uh, look at the look at a few additional cuts of the data, looking at uh, racial distributions and language distributions in our new hire data and our staff retention data to see how this compares and if there is any uh, parallels between what we see in staff retention and scholar retention by these cuts. And we also are uh, giving this week an equity pulse survey to all of our staff just to ensure that we are casting a wide net and collecting and hearing all voices uh, that want to speak up and contribute. Uh, from there, we're going to be working to draft objectives and strategies over July that we will continue refining as we move into August. Uh, part of that work is going to uh, include uh, looking at certain processes in the talent space. Once we start getting firmer on what our strategies are going to be, we imagine that there's there's going to be a need and an opportunity to uh, look at the processes that can either help or hinder those efforts, thinking specifically about recruitment and hiring, uh, or if there is anything that shows up when we look at, well, who was leaving and at what rates. So this work is going to happen in July, and then we plan to bring you our final plan in August at the board retreat. Uh, so with that, I, I know was, I hope it was a comprehensive update on what we've learned and what we've looked at so far. Uh, I would love to open it up to you guys to hear what resonates, if anything. Was there anything that was surprising uh, and what questions or wonderings do you have for us that you would like to ask or for us to continue thinking about as we continue doing this work? Hi, this is Ricky. Um, I was going to ask a really quick question, which is, 
you know, I know that you're going to give an advocacy update, and I haven't quite brought myself up to speed with this, but I think this is all really great work, and it's like you have a lot of good opportunities here um, to continue to go down this path, but with the political climate and the bills that are in the Texas legislature about identifying these areas and, and you know, how you teach around them, is there a risk of us not being able to do some of this work in the way that we know that it should be done. And would you like me to chime in? Sure, Yasmin. Yeah, Ricky. Um, uh, so we are working really hard um, with James behind the scenes on House Bill 3959 um, uh, that you are referring to uh, that uh, addresses these issues. Um, at this point, our plan, uh, if that bill is passed, is to continue our work um, uh, moving forward. Um, uh, the, the specific language in the bill um, uh, is the difference between may and shall. And so uh, there is, uh, it's actually pretty light written language, even though the things that it describes that it would not like to see in schools are very concerning. And there is nothing that has been stated about what would happen um, uh, if a school was to do those things. Probably the, the most problematic is that teachers can opt out of participating in a lesson or training. So that's more of an operational issue that a school would have to face, but broader from a strategic standpoint. Um, the bill is a little bit light in in actually preventing school districts from doing that. I'm just trying to be really delicate in my words here, but we are behind the scenes, uh, very engaged on the bill, but not worried that it is going to disrupt our actions going forward. Yes, and for those of us who don't know about, I appreciate that you're trying to dance around something, but I don't understand what it is we're all dancing. Sure. Around. And sure. I think it's worth talking about if that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Yep. I'm happy to be specific. Um, so there is a bill that's going through the House and Senate right now. It's the informal language around it is called a culture wars bill. That that's just the informal language of it. And basically what it does is states that um uh it would like not like to see current events being taught in Texas schools and that um, it would put constraints around any type of culturally responsive professional development offered to teachers. And so this light language in it, though it's talking about very serious things, basically would say it, um, an individual teacher could say, I don't want to go to this culturally responsive training today, or I don't feel comfortable talking about gun rights as part of a you know government lesson yeah. that might be taking place. And so um, that is the nature of this bill uh, is trying to constrain um, uh, what is being taught or trained to teachers around discussing current events and anything related to culturally responsive pedagogy. Does it have anything to do with critical race theory teaching? In the school. Yes, I mean, that is definitely um, uh, an explicit piece of it, but this bill is far more expansive in all of the explicit things that it calls out, um, but is definitely being driven by that. And Cullum, I don't know if you're raising your hand because you have some additional yep. context on it. Go for it. Well, I don't know if I have context. I, just, I guess I just have a uh, sort of an open ended question or two about it. Uh, not so much the bill as uh, some of the well, closely related content in uh, Anne's uh, very interesting, useful presentation. Great job, Anne. Thank you. Um, um, so the, I guess I want to ask about the issue of same race uh, teachers for scholars. Um, I, um, uh, I I fully, well, to the extent I've read about it and to the extent Anne's just presented on it uh, or the team has presented on it, I, I fully understand the uh, that uh, data uh, support the benefits of uh, of, you know, students having exposure to same race uh, teachers. Um, I wonder when you put that in the larger context of uh, kind of American law and society, um, uh, I guess I have a couple of questions about it. One is strictly about the law. 
because uh, in, in principle, if we actually said like such and such a classroom has to have a Hispanic teacher and this other classroom has to have a black teacher, does that in a sense um, uh, literally define a racial uh, prerequisite for a specific uh, job in a way that could be, you know, I, I just don't know how the, the law speaks to that, but it, 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 it's, it's different than most other things we ever uh, talk about in, you know, in labor law and workplaces, if that's where we're going. Um, uh, and I guess that related question is uh, recognizing that the data points in that direction. Uh, what, what Yasmin, do you see as the larger kind of um, discussion around the idea of trying to create what could be perceived, like could be you know written about in the media or criticized by our opponents or our critics as uh, in a sense, a uh, deliberate racial segregation of our uh, classrooms to a certain degree. So I worry about both the, the, the legal and the, uh, if you will, the uh, reputational or public relations aspects. What do you think? Just raising the question. I don't know what I think. Yeah, I don't think we're trying to do that explicit type of matching that Anne is talking about, um, uh, Cullum. She's just trying to say, so I think that it maybe came across a little bit too literally her presentation. We're just trying to say that if we increase um, our Latinx teacher population, more of our Latinx kids over their course of their time at Uplift will happen to have a teacher that looks like them versus as a matter of, today. Just as and a matter of statistics. Of random exactly, exactly. It's, it, okay, it's nothing understand. to do about going in and doing some kind okay. of specific cure or there. And I think if I can chime in for a minute too, Please. Colum, like my honest answer is I don't know yet how this is going to translate into like clear objectives, what specifically we're trying to move the needle on, and then how we're going to get there. But this was something that was reoccurring when we reviewed the literature to see yep, yep. what does the research tell us about the impact of educator demographics and yep. student achievement. So it was one of the most prevalent themes when we were looking at the research in the literature, which is why we felt compelled to bring that to the surface and talk about it with you guys. But my honest answer is uh, I don't know yet uh, to what degree that will shape where we land as far as having concrete objectives and goals and targets around uh, wanting to see kids have access to same race teachers at different points uh, or you know how specific that will get. But I think what you're raising in regards to uh, optics and uh, legal questions, I mean, those of course are all things that we think about and we'll continue thinking about sure. as we uh, right, kind of move into the next uh, iteration of the planning yeah, process. And I'm not remotely and taking think, hand or arguing against the data, only just raising the question, uh, what exactly does this look like operationally? And are you all thinking about all the angles on it? Well, I'll, I'll just book in that question by saying from a, from a labor law perspective, and when you look at um, just DEI and HR strategies, it's it's about really just expanding the the pool of talent and really looking at what's available, you know, who's in the mix. So looking at your stu your student teacher mix and making sure that the students have a diverse experience. Well, that that that, that I'm sure no one would argue against that. That's a yes. <laughs> a, a, excellent yeah. Uh, material. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, Michelle it, it, has a question for you. Oh, okay. I was Her just going to say real raised. quick. Oh, sorry. Colin, if you want to talk offline, I'm happy to chat with you too, Colin, offline. I was, you know, as we as we roll along at some point, Alex, no, no urgency to it. OK. And I was just going to just, you know, why I asked that question is because I think you bring up a good point, too, is that whether or not this law goes through, we all know where where the political climate and like just in general in our community stands and how divisive everything is. but. I do think that the work that this shows and, and to Colin's point is like the data is there. Obviously, you know, there's lots of research that shows that the more that we can head toward this North Star or have a, a good balance, it's going to benefit our scholars. Um, I also think back to the Bain study and the fact that, you know, on the law, like the retaining this diver diverse group of, of students um, across the board, the more that we can do things like this and understand where that is and train to it, support it, and, you know, do that, but also understand as a board, how do we talk about this and how do we present it to the community in a way that hopefully <laughs> avoids some pitfalls that we don't want to get into, right? But then also, you know, ensures that we're able to share the good work that we're doing, you know, and, 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 and be strategic about it, so. And Ricky, just to be fully transparent, we, 
are 99.9% .9 confident this bill will pass. It's going to pass on completely down party lines, uh, and it is the governor and lieutenant governors, one of their top three priorities. And we are even struggling to get amendments put on it um, because, uh, you know, no one wants to kind of disrupt the powers that be in terms of what the top three priorities are. So at this point, we're trying to just minimize how bad it is. Yeah. And Yasmin, I see that both, uh, it looks like Michelle and Lael both have their hands up as well. Great. Michelle, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, um, realistically, dealing culturally with each area that our schools are located in and with the population that we serve, that we do have to be extremely, extremely careful about hiring and pigeonholing people because of the color of their skin or because of the language they speak. Because uh, if you want to go full circle on this, we could actually wind up looking more like the schools of the 50s than what than what we intend to. And as a person, as an as a African-American woman who has a doctorate degree and never had a black teacher in her life, there is, you know, it's not necessarily about the color of their skin as much as it is the competency that is being taught and the, the community that embraces the school. Now, I never had a black teacher, but I had plenty of black people in the community who were supporting me in what I did. And that's almost, that's almost just as important. That, that's yeah, all Michelle, Michelle, thank you for that comment. And that's definitely something that we're taking into account um, that there is a level of nuance that is that is required and that we're looking at, you know, micro situations and macro situations. Um, and so the data definitely supports both and that charter schools are already, you know, more diverse than public schools. Mm -hmm. And so to your point, you know, you have to really look at these factors and that because of systemic pressures, if you're not intentional, um, you, you could either end up looking like the schools of the 40s or the 50s, or you could um, end up not making, sh not having the experience for the scholars that they need to have to be successful. Exactly. It's just, it's just as, as important uh, for them to see people who look like them in leadership as it is for them to be in the classroom so they have something to strive towards. Yeah, totally agree. But thank you. I do agree that the research is is there and, and it's it's very clear. But Absolutely. We just, we just have to be very extremely careful about how it's applied. And I appreciate that sentiment. And like I shared uh, at one point in my presentation, right, that that sentiment, too, was definitely something that came up as we talked about the data and talked about the research with our campus leaders as well. But thank you, Michelle. Lael, I see your hand up still. Do you have a question? Uh, just real quick, um, phenomenal data. You know, it's one thing to think about something. It's a whole nother thing to have the data presented to react to. So thank you for the hard work that is required to collect that kind of data and, and present it in a meaningful way and did a fabulous job. Um, and so I'm glad I had a few minutes. I probably still don't have it quite together, but I really, I was so glad you asked that question because I felt like others probably had that question. So I was glad you asked it. But I, what I just simply want to react to is that um, it's, I can't, it is just bizarre to me that we are having a conversation about putting people of color in the classroom. Now, I cannot, they tell me I'm intelligent, and uh, some days I really can think smartly or intellectually. But this is just bizarre that we are having this conversation about putting people of color in the classroom. Now that is all I want to say right now, but thank you for the opportunity to have the conversation. Yeah, thank you, Leo. So I want to thank Anne and Jerry for uh, their time and all of their support. Obviously, we are spending a lot of energy on this. Um, uh, the. Board Strategic Planning Committee will be deeply engaged on this and, and 
John McPherson's son graduated from college, so he was not able to be with us today, but he's been kept in the loop on this. And if you are not a member of the Strategic Planning Committee but would like to join our June working session, please just shoot me a note. We will include you in it, and then we will spend a much larger chunk of time on this uh, at our upcoming board retreat. So with that, um, uh, I think Eric's going to give a very, very quick advocacy update since we already covered one of the bills, uh, as in I know we do have to move into executive committee. Good evening, everybody. Hello. Thank you. I, I promise to be brief and um, definitely with five days left of the 87th legislative session, it is moving at a fast, fast pace. And so definitely appreciate everyone's questions. And thank you, Yasmin, for providing those quick responses um, and definitely adding in to those issues. Uh, big, big bill at stake um, as of today is that we do not have our general appropriation bill yet signed by both the House and the Senate. Um, there was talk at the beginning of the week, or I should say at the end of last week, uh, that perhaps a special session would have to occur in order to get that final bill uh, through. Um, as you know, Article 3 being the general education bill um, has a lot to do with our funding for the next two years, so mindfully watching that. Um, I will start off also by getting to some of these bills a big round of applause. Uh, some bill that we had watched and certainly worked last session during the 86th session was a TRS health care bill. Uh, that bill is actually going before the governor and will be at his desk. Uh, a big thank you to Colum, who for the past two years, uh, this is a bill that we have certainly worked. It was a part of our advocacy uh, legislative agenda. We watched it as it went through an interim study uh, last year and finally got this option for school districts to opt out of the health care for current employees. Um, and again, this is just something that's going to be available in uh, 2022 and for again allow for better options for our current teachers and staff to have a, a, a more meaningful opportunity so a big thank you a bill that we saw be ruled out for a point of order was sb 47 um yesterday that bill um, looks like it has died and that is a, a bill that we were certainly watching as it relates uh to city municipality issues and just really just bringing parity uh, we, we are going to be working behind the scenes and trying to perhaps get this on a special item um, and, and certainly uh, we'll provide more details as that comes out because members um, in the legislature will be going back for redistricting in the fall. And so there's already um, talk amongst lawmakers about other items that perhaps didn't get added on or didn't reach the finish line to uh, make it once again it being a priority for the governor. Um, again, some other issues that we're watching, again, is the um, HB 1545. Yes, it's considered the HB 3 cleanup bill, but we have some provisions that we really like as it relates uh, to our 1882 partnership schools, as well as our teacher incentive allotments. And so everyone in, in, and we as well are watching that bill and it looks to finally be made the final hurdle. Um, and again, we kind of already noted, but um, with the uh, Texas curriculum bill um, is the bill that we had discussed. And uh, as we know that we are working behind the scenes and a big thank you uh, to James and uh, his team and, and uh, really trying to work to try to get some better language in that bill. So um, and there was the question as it relates to the virtual school uh, program. And I can tell you that what lawmakers are debating is they like for this to be optional for uh, both public charter schools as well as local school districts. Um, however, they like to have this capped at 10% of the uh, school or district's um, entire uh, class. So that is something that we are watching. Um, the bill has looks like it to be going to the floor as of tomorrow, uh, and we will be watching that. Uh, this, again, is something that picked up steam within the last 10 days. Um, but uh, glad to certainly answer any questions that anyone might have. I just want to thank Eric so much. I mean, seven days a week he is tracking bills, heading to Austin, um, uh, just really advocating for us and our perspectives on these bills. He's doing a fantastic job and James is doing a great job uh, as chair behind the scenes offering his support. Okay. 
real fast? Please, of course, Colin. I know I should do the, the pan button, but- uh, It's um, okay, it's uh, okay, uh, we'll see you. Jasmine and Eric, just to, just very quickly, um, uh, what is the, um, uh, from, from this actual mix, the, uh, the, the, the best opportunity or the best thing that might happen for Uplift in this, and what do you, in your judgment, is the single biggest uh, worry in this, in this slew of, uh, of uh, legislative activity? Well, this healthcare opt out is a huge win for us. The state's healthcare system is expensive and not great. Um, uh, and we were locked in, as were other school districts. So to actually be able to go to the open market and offer um, a better quality product is a real win for our staff. Uh, and, and then House Bill 3 has some real benefits to us, uh, in, including some funding benefits. So uh, those are the biggest wins for us. And uh, absolutely, without a doubt, the most concerning bill is House Bill 3979. I apologize, I said 3959 before, um, but this, you know, attempt to put constraints uh, on what we teach and what we train our teachers on is incredibly problematic. Okay. Thank you. Well, Yasmin, as we uh, get ready to transition to the executive committee, I, I want to thank uh, everybody who, who made a presentation. Obviously, uh, very comprehensive, uh, a lot of work, uh, not just in a matter of uh, 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 weeks leading up to us, but actually months and, and a whole year leading up to uh, collecting all the data, you know, working on a game plan. Uh, and again, just want to thank the staff. I know that in this environment that we've been in for the last, uh, you know, more than a year now with the, the COVID, it's really kind of stretched the, the whole team. And I just want to applaud everybody who has really put in a lot of extra effort, uh, been very creative in finding solutions and have really kind of stayed, you know, with the team kind of moving forward with uh, what we were dealt with. And again, appreciate everything. I think the the information that we have, it just it, it's it's so in some cases overwhelming with so much information. But it just seems like we're all on the same page, all with really good data to work with, and uh, and knowing that we're coming out of the COVID environment with maybe not necessarily the same results that we'd like to have seen had we had engagement throughout the whole year. But just thanks to all the administrative staff for everything they've done. Yeah, I'll, I'll absolutely second uh, what Richard said. Uh, uh, gosh, as we reflect on the uh, end of the year here, I, I just think uh, the board can't st say in strong enough terms, uh, could we possibly have been confronted with a more challenging year? And could we could we possibly imagine our leadership team and our organization uh, more fully rising to the occasion? So certainly I second uh, Richard in saying uh, from the board, uh, deep heartfelt, uh, uh, applause and gratitude for a job very, very well done, everybody. Thank you so much for that uh, on behalf of our team. It means a lot to us. It has been a very challenging year. And thank you for everyone. It was a lot of content, uh, but we felt it was important as we brought the school year to to a close. So now it's uh, 618 and we're moving into executive session portion of the meeting. Uh, Non-executive committee members are always welcome to stay on and attend. We want to make sure and honor everybody's time and let uh, the non-executive members drop off in the meeting at the time if they wish to. So I guess we'll give them a minute. Yasmin, do you have any comments on how to, is, is there, are we able to cover everything we need to in the? Yeah, so um, uh, Jim, fortunately for executive committee, uh, Jim sent through the pre-rate, and so um, we literally uh, can have him go to his specific finance motions, and we'll just pause at each one, and if someone has a question for him, we can absolutely pause and do it. He reviewed um, a, a more detailed version of your finance update with finance committee, and obviously we had some additional um, executive committee members who participated in that session. So I feel like folks are pretty well up to speed. So if folks did flip the finance pre-read, Jim does not have to walk through it. We literally can go to each motion and then I can spend a few minutes on um, the new resolution that we put forward. If, if that's okay, that would be my proposal. Yep. 
Oh. Okay. So um, uh, then, Jim, why don't we go to your first approval, which yep. is for the amended. Page, slide. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, page Jim. Page 67. Yep. Slide 67. Okay, we're going to talk about three things, amended budget, uh, appointment of the audit firm, and then a uh, resolution that I have before Yasmin's resolution. So if we go to page 68, these are the revenue and expense categories on page 68 and 69 in our amended budget, comparing it back to our September amended budget. And just to, to let you all know that uh, we have one more meeting in September of this year when we approve a final amendment budget. That is when the state finally tells us what our final numbers are for 2021. But as you can see, page 68, uh, revenues are basically flat. They're down by $624,000, but expenses are down by $5.9 million. And if you, up in the couple pages that we missed it, I, I went through, and if you want to look at later, it's we we had a lot of favorability in, in, in costs, and we reallocated some of that to pull forward expenses from next year into this year and also start working on some of the uh, initiatives that Yasmin talked earlier about, about uh, uh, enrichment, sports, uh, et cetera. Uh, we also pulled forward uh, purchasing of equipment, but we still have a big, big favorability or a big reduction in expenses because of the COVID situation we were in. So with that, I'd like to well, I'll go ahead. Is, is there a motion to is there a motion to approve the amended budget uh, for fiscal 2021? John Becker, so moved. Thank you, John. Is there a second? Michael Stack, I second. Thank you. Uh, are there any votes against the motion? If not, I'll ask Alex to note that all members of the executive committee present voted in favor of the motion, and the motion passes. Thank you. And then on page on page 71, uh, we've used the same uh, audit firm Weaver and Tidwell for the last five years. Uh, they're proposing a $1,700 increase uh, in their base fees up to $7,400. Yesterday, we had an audit committee committee audit committee meeting, and they recommend that the board uh, approve the appointment of Weaver and Tidwell to do our audit this year. Is there a uh, motion to approve Weaver as auditors for 2021? Uh, Dardo, so move. So move. Thank you. Is there a second? We had Ardo and Michael, so we can use one as the primary and one as the second. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Was Michael was the second? Yes, Michael yeah, was right, the second. Okay. Ardo yeah. was the first. Thanks, Alex. Okay. Are there any votes against the motion? Hearing none, I ask Alex to note that all members of the executive committee present voted in favor of the motion and the motion passes. Thank you. Okay, the uh, first resolution that I'll talk about is a uh, board resolution regarding payment of benefits. So in, in the summer, right before school starts, we have open enrollment and all employees get to pick their pre-tax and after-tax benefits. Pre-tax benefits being health care, after-tax benefits being some of the additional things we have on life insurance and cancer insurance and dis extra disability, et cetera. Uh, usually a reconciliation should take place uh, every, at, at the end of the first month to make sure that uh, what our vendor for our benefits enrollment had in their system versus what we have in our, in our, in our system and, and what ultimately gets deducted from, in, in, from our employees. That, uh, that, and if, uh, that reconciliation did not occur every month that occurred in December. And then that record reconciliation, we found that approximately $123,000 worth of benefits were not uh, taken out of our employees' uh, checks that uh, basically Uplift paid for them without deducting. And it, it impacted like 20% uh, of our employees. In that, in the January timeframe, management made a decision not to collect these payments as allowed for in our employee handbook as there was a recognition of the extra additional stress and hardship for 
has mm -hmm. impacted Upland's employees during the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have put in place corrective actions already and more are being imp implemented so that com we can complete reconciliations on a more timely basis in the future. Um, we are bringing this uh, this resolution to the board because uh, basically you're affirming the actions that uh, management took when we did not collect these uh, funds from our employees. Okay. Um, if there's not any questions, I'll I'll ask if there's a motion to approve the resolution approving the forgiveness of uh, these overpayments of insurance premiums for benefits. And Richard, this was also covered with both Finance Committee and Audit, just as an FYI. Yes, and it was. Michael Stack, I move. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any votes against the motion? Hearing none, I ask Alex to note all members of the executive committee present voted in favor of the motion and the motion passes. Hey, Richard, I'm sorry. Did we get a second on that? Oh, yeah, we need a second, Richard. Second. I second. Leo? Leo. Leo second, it. Alex. Okay, thank you, Leo. Um, again, Jim, I know uh, it's been a busy year trying to close out a year and, and dealing with. Uh, an ever-changing revenue source and an ever-changing expense model and I appreciate the work that you and your team does in making that happen. Um, Yasmin, yeah, I guess I'm going to turn it over to you for this yep. next kind of new topic. Sure, um, uh, and I'll go speedy on it. I just put together a slide that basically represented the email I sent uh, last night. It, we are seeing our incoming star scores and we will go into meaningful depth on them in our June board meeting, but we have a real opportunity where we need to leverage summer school for all of our different student groups and help close gaps uh, and use that very purposeful learning time. Throughout the school year, we have struggled with high school um, uh, students and making sure that we can get equal attention on academics as they are also um, you know, being pulled to support their families and find work opportunities. And this summer is a key time that our students in high school typically have summer jobs. And so we saw an idea um, uh, late last week that is being tested out in New York public schools using philanthropy, uh, where there are financial incentives or scholarships uh, being given to high school students for participating in an intensive in-person summer school program, which we would run for the first three weeks of June, starting June 7th, which would be our last um, day of school, before our high school students who qualify need to sit again the end of the month for their end of course exam. In essence, we want to create an opportunity that is more compelling for them to spend their time than working at an hourly job, um, which they obviously could do when they were not with us in school. And so uh, Alex has consulted with our external um, uh, council, and there is nothing that prohibits us from being able to do this, though no district has ever done it before in Texas that we know of. And really the only example we know of in the nation is now New York doing that, doing this this summer. So we have a set of philanthropic funds that we can deploy for this. Uh, and we wanted to ask your permission to let us continue to work with Alex, our external counsel, and Jim to make sure it's structured appropriately in terms of how we would issue uh, checks ultimately to our students. We believe that um, uh, from an accounting purpose, we would have parents and kids um, uh, sign off on receiving this and that they would receive a 990 uh, that then they would be responsible for. But um, I'm really hopeful that this additional way of being able to reward our students and motivate our high school students to do an intensive summer school program that sets them up to pass an end of course exam that is required for high school graduation by the state 
um, uh, will be that extra incentive and focus that they they need. Um, we have a, a much higher number this year of students in the, the situation where they have failed an end of course exam, and we do need to start moving our kids through those exams so they can be on track to graduate. So I'm happy to take any questions. This is an incredibly innovative idea. We feel like there's no legal risk. We've been identified um, in order to pursuing it, but we'll, we would definitely be out on the forefront um, uh, on Texas on leading on this front. And how, how many students are we anticipating that might participate or? 200 is our, would be our target. <laughs> And this is again for students who might have failed multiple end of course exams or are meaningfully far behind from passing. We have students who might be just a few questions away and there are virtual and online ways that will support them being ready for their retest. But this is truly for those students who need to be in front of a teacher. Um, and so we would be doing 20 hours a week for three weeks uh, of intense support to get them ready. I'm happy to take any questions and I again apologize that this was a last minute ad, but really time is of the essence uh, as we are trying to uh, accelerate um, coming out of these learning losses. I, I am excited about this opportunity for our scholars. I, I'm glad it, it, it last minute or, or the fact that it's present. Um, with so much learning loss and that we could provide for those who have the greatest need, I, I think it's pretty awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I guess I'd say it's uh, it, it, it's unconventional and I'm old fashioned enough, uh, Yasmin, to have uh, some deep seated skepticism about paying uh, kids to learn, but I recognize it's an experiment. It's unusual times. It's innovative. So, uh, you know, I want to be supportive of um, the leadership team in an interesting uh, idea and uh, you know hey if it works the proof's in the pudding yeah thank you colin thank you Leo. well if there's uh, no other questions or comments uh i'll take a motion to approve the resolution to approve the 2021 summer school scholarship program as presented are there uh a motion in a second. This is our moved. Thank you, Ardo. Is there a second? This is sure. Kathy Estrada. Thank you, Kathy. Are there any uh, any votes against the motion? Hearing none, I'll ask Alex to note that all members of the executive committee present uh, voted in favor of the motion, and the motion passes. Thank you. Richard, given we are over on time and I we do not have a community speaker, um, I'm happy to cover the closed session item in our June board meeting, given it's just a few weeks away since it's it's not time sensitive um, and the issue has been addressed. If you'd like, or I can take a few minutes um, and and cover it now, whatever your preference is. I'll, uh, I'll leave it up to you. I know we're just a few minutes over, so unless somebody Unless we lose our quorum, I don't mind staying on. I don't mind if it helps you. OK, if folks are OK staying on for a few minutes, obviously anyone who needs to drop off is welcome to. And so then uh, at this time, if staff could drop off, please, except for uh, Alex and Deborah, if she's still on, is welcome to stay on. Um, uh, and um, and our executive committee, that'd be great. We'll go quickly into closed session. OK, and while they're dropping off, I'll go ahead and read that. The time is now 5.33 p.m. and the board will retire to a closed session pursuant to 551.074 of the Texas Government Code to deliver the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee. I ask that any person on the call other than executive committee, Yasmin and Alex, to please drop off. Member of the board is present. No decision or action was made during the closed session. Alex, I understand we do not have any community members who have signed up. That's correct. Yeah, we do not have any community members. OK. Uh, that being said, uh, we have no further business before the board and the meeting is hereby adjourned. The time is 644 p.m. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. I'm so sorry that we um, that we went long. Thank you, guys. No problem. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bob.
Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.